Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending January 13th, 2018. I would like to thank my friend Thomas H. for this first link, and thank you everybody that sends in the links. This is from CNN. This little satellite will investigate a curious star and its planet. And we're talking about a little satellite. We're talking about one of those micro satellites about the size of a shoebox or a little bit smaller. Uh, on Friday, a small satellite named PICSAT launched an attempt to make a big observation watching an exoplanet crossing in front of its star this year. The nanosatellite is about 2.3 inches in diameter, is the size of three apples stacked on top of each other, and uses about 5 watts of power, the same as an economical light bulb. It was designed and built by scientists and engineers at the National Research Center, Science uh, Research Center in Paris, and the Paris Observatory in France. It will study the Beta Pictoris system, 63.4 light years from Earth, the Beta Pictoris star is very bright, but surrounded by a giant disk made of dust and debris, the leftovers of the star's formation. And to astronomers, it's a 23-million-year-old star is uh, quite young. The star was discovered to be orbiting by a giant gas exoplanet in 2009 named Beta Pictoris b. The planet is seven times more massive than Jupiter and orbits its star at the same distance. Um, the one-year mission of the PICSAT is to uh, determine the exact size of the planet, its atmosphere, and its chemical composition. And to me, it's just amazing that a satellite this small contains all the necessary equipment and a decent enough quality telescope. Uh, one of the things they need to do to do this is uh, a lot of satellites, the bigger satellites, are very expensive to use and their time is very limited. A lot of people are vying for time on the big expensive satellites and the big expensive telescopes. So you can't really afford to have those pointed at the same star for a long, long time, whereas this tiny satellite only costs a few million dollars, so they can have the satellite constantly pointed at the star, no problem at all. And I even looked, too, I was wondering what the um, guy, the inertial system is for uh, keeping it pointed in the same direction, because that's quite a feat to keep a satellite um, up in uh, outer space pointed in the exact same direction direction and it does have little reaction wheels too, little flywheels in different uh, axes. There's usually at least three of them and maybe even a backup um, diagonal wheel too to make up if one of the wheels goes bad, but it actually uses the regular reaction wheels like the bigger satellites do, so um, hopefully this thing can be trained uh, on this thing for a, a long enough time. Uh, they say sometime between the summer of 2017 and summer 2018 they want these observations to take place, so uh, this is kind of cool. I had not heard about this before when Tom sent me this link in. I did not know they had a little tiny satellite like this with a good enough telescope to detect uh, uh, the planet. It's not going to, obviously it detects the planet by the light dropping, so this is not a, the kind of telescope I'm not talking about. You're not going to see a picture of this planet like you see a nice large picture of Jupiter and all the uh, different uh, colors and stuff like that. That's not what this telescope is about. This telescope is actually uh, about just the uh, detecting the amount of light dropping and some other um, types of detections and stuff like that. But don't expect uh, a picture anytime soon, even from the more expensive satellites. It just, we don't have the resolution of the telescopes. And I'm also going to include the uh, link below to the article I just talked to you about. And I'm going to um, include a link below to the PICSAT site itself where you can get more details. That's where I looked to find out. I wanted to know uh, what type of aiming they were going to do. I thought for a satellite that small, they certainly can't use fuel to do it. They would have to use some type of reaction wheels and uh, definitely in the details here when I looked at the uh, um, very, you can look at the various things. You've got science mission, satellite payload and operations, among other things, mission data. You can look up in there. So the links to these things and all the articles I talk about will be found down below. And next up from Wired Magazine, <clears throat> scientists discover clean water ice just below Mars surface. Now, right now, where they've discovered it is just up in the northern parts and the southern parts of Mars, which are kind of cold, so it's not likely uh, when we do eventually land uh, uh, men on Mars that they're going to be up near these areas, but we're still looking, and there may be more. So it says, locked away beneath the surface of Mars are vast quantities of water ice, but the properties of that ice, how pure it is, how deep it goes, and what shape it takes remains a mystery to planetary geologists. These things matter to mission planners to future visits to Mars, be they short-term, or long-term settlers will need to understand the planet's surface ice reservoir reserves if they want to mine it for drinking, growing crops, or converting into hydrogen for fuel. And evidently, from what they've discovered already, um, 
the water is a lot more. Well, now scientists have discovered such a site. In fact, with the help of High Rise, a powerful camera aboard NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, they've found several places of this ice, and the detailed observations believe that this ice is actually pretty clean. I mean, it's not going to be totally clean. It's going to have some debris in it, but um, there are eight Martian regions where erosion has uncovered large, steep cross sections of the underlying ice. Now, for most of Mars, this ice is kind of difficult to get down to. It could be, you know, hundreds of feet down, but they're obviously because Mars has an atmosphere and erosion like our planet is, there's going to be some places where erosion has exposed this ice or made it just very near the surface. And some of these places you may not even have to deal drill down more than a couple of meters to get to it. So this is kind of cool. NASA calls the use of space-based resources in situ resource utilization and the agency thinks it will be essential to survival in deep space. Of particular interest to ISRU planners is the depths of ice and the ratio of pure ice to that mixed with its bits of Mars regolith. That just means the crud on Mars, rocks and stuff like that. The more pristine the ice and the closer it is to the surface, the less energy it takes to extract and use. Um, the only thing is, if it's only easy to get at near the north and the south, probably still going to be a difficult thing to accomplish because just like on Earth, the far northern regions and the far uh, southern regions of Earth are quite cold. Same thing on Mars. I mean, Mars is overall a pretty cold planet to start with, but if you're talking about up in the northern and the southern latitudes, it's very cold up there. So probably not likely that will be easily accessible, at least to the first settlers on Mars. And they're still talking about doing it by about the year uh, 2030 or just a little bit beyond that. So that's kind of cool. I could still possibly be alive. I'll be in my 80s maybe, late 70s, early 80s, but it would sure be nice to see. And from the mirror, General Motors reveals its plans to release a self-driving car with no steering wheel or pedals in 2019. Yeah, kind of scary looking when you look at this car, but when you realize what they're, they're setting it up for, it makes a little bit more sense. These are going to be more or less automated cars that operate as Uber or a taxi or something like that, and they're probably going to be at least at first restricted to very precise areas to where they really know their way around and not much changes or anything like that, but they also do claim these cars are good enough that they can... Uh, uh, know where uh, saw, see, those uh, sawhorses and uh, safety cones are set up and can watch for pedestrians and everything like that. And they're going to have them, I guess, uh, uh, in, in use actually by maybe uh, one or two years from now. So I'll read a little bit of the article here. <clears throat> the car calls, called Cruise AV is designed to operate safety on its own with no driver steering wheel pedals or manual controls. General Motors hopes that the cars will reduce the number of crashes on the road. In a report about driving safety, a spokesman for General Motors said, Our self-driving vehicles aim to eliminate human driver error, the primary cause of 94% of crashes and injuries. The self-driving cars will be all electric, reducing vehicle emissions and contributing to a better environment. While you might think that a lack of pedals or steering wheels would be dangerous, General Motors says the safety has been engineered in every step of the design, development, manufacturing, testing, and validation. The autom autonomous system relies on various sensors, sensors that allows the car to see the environment around it in 360 degrees. The General Motors spokesman said it is designed to identify pedestrians in a crosswalk or an object darting suddenly into its path and to respond accordingly. Uh, yeah, I think with 360 degree sensors, that kind of thing, they would probably be much better than a human being. I mean, you only got so much peripheral vision with the blind spots and stuff like that. If this vehicle can actually scan 360 degrees, it, uh, it also says it can move with the construction cones, yield to emergency vehicles, and react to avoid collisions. Once the cars have been deployed, customers will use a mobile app to request a ride, much like how they would through Uber. And they say you can even uh, make requests to when the car is on its way to you. You can request uh, music to be playing of a certain type. You can uh, say what temperature you want it to be. You could probably even tell it if you have a preferred route to take or something like that. And it'll be an app on your phone. So kind of cool. Also, um, next week, now it was just over yesterday. Um, I'm recording this on Saturday, and I believe Consumer Electronics Show uh, was over yesterday so next week I'll probably talk a little bit about it I've got a couple of articles in mind but uh, I want to actually look through and see if I can see a lot of things right now it seems the, the mass of the talk in the consumer electronics show is just more developments in TV sets they're bigger they're brighter they've got a few more details they're, everybody's talking about 4k but I kinda wanna get off on that because you know I don't wanna talk about that so much because it seems every year it's just the same stuff it's just incremental uh, improvements in the TV sets, nothing really dramatic. I mean, they've still got the ones that bend and fold and all that. Uh, just like they had last year, it's just they're a little bit better than they used to be. And 
sooner to come to market. But what I would like to do is uh, maybe see things a little bit out of the ordinary for the Consumer Electronics Show. So I'm going to look and see if I can find one or two good articles to uh, add next week to the TDD report. So until then, take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.